Hello and welcome nostalgia nerds across the land and welcome once again to another edition of Jack's Throwback Attack. So it's a great pleasure to have with me a man who has played so many puppet characters on screen down the years. It's Francis Wright. Hello. Hello there. How are you today? I'm extremely well, thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you're a puppeteer, you've done many puppet characters down the years. First off, I'd like to know about your early years and, and what led to you becoming a puppeteer. Um, I was very cynical when I was at drama school. I went to drama school very young. Um, uh, I think I went from, I graduated when I was 18. Um, and while I was there, I decided very definitely that I didn't want to be an out-of-work actor all my life and there must be something I could specialise in. And originally, you see, very grandly when I was about five years old, declared that I want, wanted to be a producer. And um, that, of course, I had no idea what that meant, but it sounded good and it was wonderful. And my my mother worked for the BBC at the time and I, so I vaguely knew that the producer was something important and I said, that's what I want to be. Um, well, it... it, it for various reasons, didn't work out. I mean, I didn't have a university degree and you couldn't be a producer without one. Um, so I, I trained as an actor instead. And while I was at drama school, I realized that one was going to be doomed fairly soon. And um, what could I possibly do that, that might mean I stood a chance of, of maintaining a career in, in entertainment, which was every, I really wanted to do. Um, and and so I... I hit on the idea, largely thanks to a, a friend of mine, um, of maybe looking at puppeteering. And um, I, I was one of the very first in my year to get a, a job, which of course you had to have an equity card in those days in order to get a job. And you couldn't get a job without an equity card and you couldn't get your equity card unless you had a job. So it was all very, um, it, it was all a bit of a vicious circle. And uh, one of the ways into entertainment generally was through children's theatre and anything that that, that, that that did that. And so I, I joined um, a wonderful company called Playboard Puppets, which were, became very well known for doing a programme called Button Moon on, on television. Um, and in, when I joined them, they were, they were touring theatres and schools on a daily basis. And I, I stayed with them on and off, I think, for about three or four years. So uh, that's how I started in that. And it was wonderful. You got to, you got to play everything from a granny to a doorknob. And, um, and you, could, you could really uh, just let rip on a range of character voices and things and, and dotty characters. And it's lovely. It's good. It does sound yeah. like good fun. And, uh... It was. It was great. Very, very, very hard work, physically very hard work, because we played, on average, during term time, we played in, in two schools a day in, in the London area, um, and most of the schools then were still those very big, old Victorian buildings which went up about four or five storeys, and the assembly hall was generally always at the top. So we had all our boxes and lighting and everything like that to, to cart up and down stairs. It was... Very good. So it went, when you're young, Governor, it's a very good training. It really is. <laughs> it also teaches you to be on time, which which uh, a lot of people could do with these days. Definitely. Uh, yeah, it does sound like good fun. And uh, I guess as well, it's also nice that you, you've been paid to do it as well, to, to just have a laugh, basically. Well, it does help. I mean, well, yeah, we, we yes, we had a laugh. You had to do a good job as well. It was it, mm. it was it was good fun. It was very hard work. It was physically very hard work. Um, so yes, you had it. You had a good laugh, but, um, but you jolly well had to concentrate on it too. You, they, you you were expected to come up with the goods, and there's no more critical audience than school children. <laughs> definitely, I can remember. <laughs> I can remember the puppet shows I watched as a child. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I can imagine that. I, I mean, like you don't really think about it, really. But you know, operating a puppet, you have got to concentrate. You've got to remember to make sure that, uh, well, for one, that it looks decent. It doesn't look rubbish, and like you know, you're operating the mouth to match what you're saying and that kind of thing. Yes, I mean that. That, that, that less less often with theatre shows, you have lip sync to worry about. But certainly, if you're in front of a camera, you have to you have to worry about the lip sync and things a, a lot now. Yeah, um, and it's you know it, 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 that's part of the job. Um, and 
one hopes one does a reasonably good job. <laughs> Some better than others, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I suppose as well, like you say, it is physically demanding because first off, like you say, you've got to carry all the equipment. But the, the main thing is you've got to squeeze yourself into some very awkward places and have your arms up in the air constantly as well. Um, yes, uh, the, the, I think the most awkward, probably the most awkward dancing I've done on any regular basis, the most physically uh, awkward was probably the... Was it? Uh, probably the head in Art Attack, which I did for a very long time. And he he sits on a on top of a kind of pillar, uh, which is quite narrow. And I was inside that with my hand up through the top of it into his into his jaw. And that's um, you, know, you can stay there for quite a long time as with uh, once once you get into it in in the course of the day. But you can actually stay there quite a long time. But um, there's not a lot of room to play with inside it, and so so you are a bit you are a bit squashed. It wouldn't be a very good uh, job for someone who is claustrophobic, basically. I think that's. I think we'll keep it like that. We 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 will keep people who are claustrophobic out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I've got to ask next is uh, what was the very first puppet role that you played on screen? Ah, heavens! Um, the very first puppet role I ever played on screen. Um, the the first one that, that that was the first one that was of any significance to me was in a schools program called You and Me, and there were two characters who lived in a market called Dibs and Cosmo, and I played Dibs, and I did that for eleven years, um, which was very. I mean, it was a wonderfully put together program. It was absolutely superbly done. Um, dealt with all sorts of things one of one of the first one of the first sort of programs that dealt with with real issues one of the first children's programs that dealt with real issues and we even did we even did a series of um programs on abuse and how to and how to and how to um give children confidence confidence to say they didn't like something or, or that that kind of thing and and um it it was a very groundbreaking program at it, of its time of its time i think um and yes I, I i would say that that was the first screen character of any significance that i did i i, I when i was with playboard we did a f- did a few television things here and there i think possibly the very first time i had my hand on anything that was on screen was i think a a, a, a sausage dog in a in a in a song about something but i i can't swear to it but the first proper one would would would, be, would have been did in um uh you and me and i've had a look at your um your blog as well you do have a long list of credits to your cv too many to mention every single one but there's definitely a few i think that are worth chatting about and i think uh what i'd like to uh bring up actually is very early in your career you worked on the uh, quite legendary show spitting image i did that was it, it was um yes there, I, um that was the mid 1980s. It was 19, 1984. I started working on that. I, I was in the second series of Spitting Image, which was the quite glamorous one, which had things like naming the royal baby, and and it was when um, uh, Prince Charles and uh, Princess Diana had their second child. That's right. It was, um, Harry it was when Harry was born, and they couldn't think what to go, and the royal family couldn't think what to call it. And uh, there was that. There was also the there was a there was a, a sketch in that which is people still quote, which is Margaret Thatcher out to dinner with the cabinet, and um, the waitress comes up to her and says, uh, "What would you like?" And she says, "I'll have raw steak." And she says, "And what about the vegetables?" And the camera pulls back, and you see the members of the cabinet sitting around the table, and Margaret Thatcher just says, "Oh, they'll have the same as me." And um, that that one has stood me in very good stead for 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 a long time. It's quite nice to be in something like that. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy my time on Spitting Image, the, not for any reason other than that it's not really my sort of humour. And um, I think I, I didn't quite get it. Um, I'm tremendously glad to have done it, and people were totally nice to me, but I, I don't think I did them justice, really. Um, but there we are. Never mind. But it was a good thing to have on the CV. Oh, very yes, yeah, most certainly. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, yes, um I think other people are better at that than I am. So um, I also miss 
not doing I, I, I did some voices but they were all pre-recorded and I, I much prefer to do live voice <clears throat> with the character I'm playing I don't, I don't like working to somebody else's soundtrack I really don't it, I feel as though I've taken, had half the character taken away and um, around the time of Spit and Image, you also worked on the legendary film Labyrinth. Um, you know, what was it like working alongside David Bowie? And uh, what character did you play? Um, Labyrinth, I worked on the whole film um, from beginning to end, uh, which was very, very nice. Um, all the auditions for it all happened while various people were doing Spitting Image. We were We've, nobody ever said anything and it was all kept very quiet it's, it's, why have you got that in your pigeonhole in the hotel blah 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 um, and uh, we all realised we were auditioning for it together and um, <clears throat> um, I uh, we, took, we had to take part in various workshops at Elstree Studios doing various things with, with prototype puppets and they they Brought, they created their team from that. Um, and I got uh, chosen as part of the team to work on one of the characters called Ludo, who was a big sort of shaggy, hairy monster thing, who was Sarah, the heroine's friend in it, and, and would appear at strategic moments to help her out or, or be a sort of lumbering presence. I think he was based on one of the characters in Where the Wild Things Are, because he certainly looked a bit like that. Um, and it was... The, the whole thing, I must say, was... was I'd, I'd only done one film before that, and that, that was a sort of sword and sorcery epic called Dragon Slayer, um, which, which was fascinating, but um, a month's work is not like six months' work, and, and Labyrinth was, was almost six months' work, I think. And it's... Making a feature film, and if you are not the star, is actually a bit like working on a building site. It, it's a wonderful experience, it, it's my goodness, you, 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 you have to really concentrate for short, very short, sharp bursts, knacker yourself for about three weeks doing very little, and, and then go back to intense concentration on something for a, for a very short period of time again and hope that it, hope that it looks good. Um, Ludo, I think, looks very, looks very good. Um, he had a wonderful man inside the body of a who's now a, a very well-known sculptor, Ron Muick, um, who um, created, I think, a lot of the Goblin characters in the film as well. Um, he he was fabulous to work with, an immensely tall, rather gangly Australian gentleman, and great fun, very, very, very dry sense of humour. Um, far happier if we could all sit in the sun rather than intensely rehearsing how to do an eye blink or something where we pretended to do things like that by instinct on the on on this film it was so uh, the people that i was working with sue dacre and donald austin we 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 made up the face team together of ludo i did his eyebrows <laughs> and um uh it, it, the, the character i think looks very nice it it, it, it looks it, it looks good um the only problem with with that was that all the facial features were radio controlled and um Elstree Studios had regular fleets of taxis going past in the high street and very often they would pick up the radio control signal and interfere with it. It could be, could be anything under the sun, you'd suddenly be in the middle of quite a dramatic moment and everything would start flickering and, and jumping up and down so you think, oh not again. So that cost quite a bit of time. <laughs> but, um, uh, D David Bowie was was absolutely professional together knew exactly what he was doing he was always nice to everybody there was nothing remotely starry about him and he just got on with the job and had a bit of a laugh where he could and got on with it i think he was also working on a film called absolute beginners at the same time i think he went off there to do that in the evenings and um so he must have he must have been very very tired by the end of it all because it was uh, he 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 did work very hard when when he was when he was on set in Labyrinth. He worked very very hard and was very you know was was extremely. Um, he was just a professional. You know he he did his job properly. 
and was also very nice, which which is what people should be, and, and he was. There's a can I tell the can I tell the Sooty story, which ties in with my bit on Sooty? Absolutely. Yeah, I was in Sooty series in fifty and fifty one playing Sweep. We 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 can we can come to that a bit later, but. Um, in Labyrinth, as, as devotees of it will know, the, the heroine, Sarah, has a baby brother who is stolen away by Jareth, the goblin king. Yeah? Yeah. And um, there are, once Jareth has taken Toby, the baby, into his castle in the Labyrinth, um, he, he's using the child to taunt Sarah into, into get, trying to get it back, obviously trying to rescue her own brother. And um, there's one moment where Jareth is sitting with the baby on his lap and he's just saying how hopeless it was and that Sarah will never, ever, ever manage to find him. And that sure enough, this child will be turned into a goblin you know, and, this, and it's all going to be exactly as Jareth wants it, never mind Sarah. And this child is staring with a kind of hypnotic look on its face, just into into middle distance, and he's just got an absolutely concentrated look on his face. And you try getting that out of any any baby, which is what Toby was. And um, the secret to all this was the fact that um, every time that child was wanted on set, it burst into floods of tears. I don't know don't know what it was. It could have been the the Goblin Castle that that upset it it could have been the appearance of goblins all around it could have been david bowie's makeup i don't know it could have been anything under the sun but every time that child was wanted on set it burst into floods of tears and nothing would keep it quiet somebody noticed well david bowie had noticed that one of the puppeteers um doing background characters had had a little toy sooty puppet and was playing with that earlier on between takes or something. It was just sort of showing, showing it and playing, playing with it. And he suddenly had the bright idea. And he said, um, have you got that sooty puppet handy? Um, sooty puppet was accordingly produced immediately. David Bowie put it on his spare hand that wasn't holding the child. <laughs> and the child's mesmerized expression is entirely because just out of shot is a puppet sooty waving at it, which David Bowie has got on his other hand and is just waving his <laughs> puppet at the baby, which is, which is staring absolutely transfixed by, by sooty. So that's how sooty manages to get into labyrinth. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I'm amazed that nobody's ever picked up on that as a story, but they haven't. I, mean, I was I, I was there. I watched it happen. So it was um, it, quite a nice thing to have seen. Um, also shows a lovely human side to David Bowie as well, because it was I mean, he, he was so, he was so good with it. <laughs> So uh, yes, <laughs> definitely. That is uh, that is a great story. That is fantastic. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it would have been great if Sooty actually had a part in it. That would be uh, something, wouldn't it? <laughs> what Sooty? Mm, yes, there probably would have been copyright issues. Yes, of probably. <laughs> and, and Sooty can't sing, can he? No, that's true. That's true. Right. Probably wouldn't have been uh, very good then. But uh, that is uh, quite a uh, quite a good mental. That is quite a funny mental image. Uh, just yeah. an image of David Bowie uh, operating a Sooty puppet. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I wish I had. I, I wish I had taken a snapshot of it, but I didn't um, because it was much more difficult to take snapshots of things in those days. And everybody knew about it, and you, you couldn't just do it on your mobile phone. Um, but uh, yes, it was. Uh, it was a nice moment. Um, there, there, were, there were lots, lots of very nice moments in that. It was good. Good, good memories. And the good thing is, is that the film is still very popular all this time later. It is, isn't it? Yes, uh, yes. I, I'm always rather surprised to learn how, how many people have seen it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. It was, it, was, it, was, it was good fun to do. Very, very, very hot during the summer, because especially the bog of eternal stench, which was um, on one of the very big shooting stages. Um, and was a huge trough of um, quite liquid wallpaper paste um, mixed with a sort of green dye, I think, which is which is how they made it sort of bubble up and down when they blew compressed air through it. Um, and uh, because because wallpaper paste is organic, 
and um, basically rots. Uh, during the course of the summer, um, every possible mosquito and insect that discovered it loved it, and the place became a kind of colony for wildlife. It was, it was very, it was very um, interesting, and it began to smell pretty bad as well. But there we are. Never mind. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Um, am I right in thinking? Because I've only watched Labyrinth once. Mm. Um, am I right in thinking it had something to do with uh, Jim Henson or the Henson Company? Am I right in most that? Most certainly, yeah, 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 most certainly. I think <clears throat> Jim Henson directed it, um, <coughs> and the Hensons uh, made all the the um, puppets and and various uh, exotic characters in it. <coughs> um, and it was, it was, it was. I think the first film they'd done before the film they'd done before that was The Dark Crystal. Um, and this was this was a kind of develop. This was a kind of development of that. If this was the way they wanted to take things, um, and it was very. I think I think it was very successful for them. I, I, I don't actually know, but I think it was. I think it was pretty successful. Um, they certainly seemed to be very happy with it, which was good. Um, I think they were. I think they were less happy with the story of the Dark Crystal than they were with the story of Labyrinth. But, um, I, look, I prefer the look of the Dark Crystal to the look of Labyrinth, but that's just personal taste. Um, so uh, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was. A, it was an interesting experience altogether. And of course, Jennifer Connelly, who played Sarah, went on to great things and, and is doing very, very well. I think uh, as, a, as an actor. Um, which she richly deserves, because that girl, who I think was only 15 at the time, was every bit as professional as David Bowie in, in totally different ways. And she, she got uh, flung about quite a lot, literally, on, on, on set and, and um, was, was very, 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 very stoical all the way through it, T- took everything in her stride and did it very well. It was always good-humoured. She was an extremely, extremely pleasant young woman. She was lovely. Mm, that's good. That's really good to hear. And uh, one final question about Labyrinth. Um, what was it like working with Jim Henson? The thing about it was that Jim was liked by everybody. And he was always extremely easy to deal with. Everybody really enjoyed working with him. Um, and this included the, this included the whole crew as well. Um, the the continuity lady, I think they're called script consultants now, but they're, they're the ones who make, you know, will let you know whether three buttons are done up or four. Um, she said at the very end of it, at the end of shooting party, she, she, she asked me if I'd enjoyed it. And I said, oh, yeah, definitely, yes. And she, I, said, I said, did you? And, and, and she said, oh, yes, she said. And I said, well, why? Um, she said, because Jim is a gentleman. She said, he, so many directors are not. Jim is a gentleman and um, knows exactly what he is doing and is always pleasant to work with. And it's nice, you know, it's a terrific accolade, really, for somebody like that who had done just about every film under the sun to say that it's, it's nice. It's nice that that, that that counts for something, I think, you know, that, that, his, that his basic good manners and his way of treating people is just really, really noticed by everybody. Definitely, definitely. I'm very much missed. And uh, another famous uh, TV show that you worked on uh, was the 90s BBC adaptation of Five Children and It, and you played the Samiad. I have to say, the puppetry of that character looked fantastic, and there's quite a magic to it that you can't really get with the likes of CGI. You know, exactly. Well, yes, I, I'm, I'm glad you say that because you're quite right. You can't get it with CGI because that tends to be soulless. Um, it can be perfect in every possible way, except that something somewhere is missing. And, and I think it's just missing its human element, if that makes sense. Um, there is something about sticking your hand up the middle of a character and, and actually... Doing it like that, that immediacy where you're providing everything, including that you're doing the voice live, you're doing, you're, you're moving the mouth live, you've, you've got people around you who know exactly what they're doing with you, and it just creates a kind of unit. And also you've got the, the interaction with the children or whoever the character is playing with, um, who relate to something like that far more than they relate to a sort of lump of polystyrene on the end of a stick. Um, 
when when they can actually see it there and have a bit of banter with it between takes and things. And we you know we we had I think the Samiad scenes in that first series were shot over a period of about a fortnight in a gravel pit in Dorset. Um, very done very quickly because the children were under a certain amount of time pressure because they're not allowed to they were not allowed to work more than a certain amount of hours a day and so we had to get their scenes done quickly and efficiently um and we just we just had a great deal of fun doing it it was like a holiday it was really superb of course it was also the beginning of the gulf war i think it was the gulf war um and uh the place where we were shooting um, was right near an RAF base. So quite frequently we had RAF planes whizzing over to go over to the Gulf and uh, do and do their bit, um, in, including the pilot who'd done all the flying shots for the series, for, for the scenes where the children learn to fly at the end. And um, so, so that was that I gave it an added kind of poignancy as well. But it was a very special experience. That, that really was lovely. I think that's still one of my favourites. Well, I think it is probably still my favourite. Um, and and the, the the team I had with me working the Sammy had arms and feet and eyebrows and things were absolutely wonderful. They were really extraordinary. They were so good. It was so good. We're still friends. We we still see each other occasionally. It's lovely. They're all very very busy now. They, they work in mostly in films and, and special effects in films. They are very very good at their jobs. Incredibly good. Fantastic, and uh, I, I was having a look at it last night actually, and the Samiad comes up from 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 up the, out of the ground, and I, I, and I was wondering how do you operate a puppy from underground? They um, uh, planned it very carefully. The thing was gone into with meticulous detail, and <clears throat> the the from the word go, they decided that the best way to do it was to dig an underground room for us all. Um, bear in mind, there were, I think there were five of us all together working with Samiad. Um, they they dug an underground room, which we all went down into. Um, there was a hole in the middle of it uh, through which I put my arm and Samiad was put on top of that. Um, there was a lot of sand and a lot of stuff called vermiculite, which gardeners use. Um, which is something to, something to do with potting, I think, um, and 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 this is what gives the sand its slightly silvery look in the series, um, because that but, but that got absolutely everywhere. You couldn't move for vermiculite; you'd find it in your knickers at the end of the day. Um, and uh, it, 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 yeah, it was. Well, we we were very 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 comfortably treated. We had a nice time down there. It was lovely. We even had a fridge uh, to keep cool drinks in <laughs> and, uh, so they they sorted it all out extremely well it was good fun wow I, I, you wouldn't have thought they've actually gone through all the trouble of building an underground uh, room to for that but that's that's incredible that must have been quite dark and quite hot no it was all right we had we had um we had fans and things to keep us cool between takes which was fine um it it's also the trouble taken over something like that saves an awful lot of time. I think this is something people often don't understand, is that if you actually really plan it carefully and work out how you're going to do it and and make everybody as comfortable as possible, it saves so much time because they can get on with the job. And and it, and it, and it did. It works. It worked like that. You know, everybody's everybody's happy. They don't resent anything. You there's nothing. You can't you can't get little niggles going. It it work. It works terribly well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It, it's uh, you know, if you don't cut corners, then you, uh, you know you do a. It looks a lot better in the uh, the finished product. Yes, and it doesn't always make it much more expensive either. It does. It 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 it, it just you, you, all they need to do is, is think about it a little bit beforehand, and and uh, and also the other way the other way to, to do it is actually talk about talk to people who might have done it, so that they actually know possibly what the best route is. Then, if you can't have everything you want, you can reach some kind of compromise. But the worst thing is when you're suddenly presented with. A puppet that you haven't ever actually seen before or done anything with before, and they say, right, just, just, just do that and be funny. Ah, doesn't always work like that. <laughs> <laughs> Is the script funny? Mm, well, 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, I have seen the video as well on YouTube uh, of in between takes of Sammy had singing. I have to oh, say, yeah. you've got a good singing voice. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, we well that that was one way of keeping um, keeping people entertained, really, because uh, because the different setups took quite a long time to arrange because the whole thing was shot with one camera rather than three or four cameras, which you'd have in normal. Uh, normal television at the time used mostly was studio based and you'd use more than one camera um for five children and this it was shot shot like a movie so it was shot with one single camera and the different setups could take quite a long time to arrange so between those you have to keep people entertained and so the best thing to do was uh, was be a kind of cabaret right the way through it. I don't think anybody actually got tired of it, which was quite flattering, really. Um, it, it was, I well, I had a wonderful time, <laughs> and uh, my 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 Sammy had team, my various um, body parts that were around me. They they joined in with it beautifully. They, we had a wonderful time. It was great. <laughs> it does look great. You can almost believe that it is, it is real. Like I say, the puppetry and the actual makeup of the puppet is, is fantastic. That is something nice, you just don't get it? on children's television anymore. Yeah, I know. Um, the, the actual um, the design of it, uh, Malcolm James, who designed it, was uh, uh, really exceptional as a, as a designer and as a, as a sculptor. My goodness, it's just, just astonishing, really astonishing. Malcolm, who... who uh, con constructed and, and um, sculpted the, the, the Samiad was just the most wonderful designer of characters like that. He's a complete, terribly um, under uh, underrated. You know, he's not underrated. People rate his work very highly, but he should be infinitely better known than he is as a, just simply for what he does. But he's so modest and just sort of almost keeps his light high, hidden under a bushel, really, and and, and um, doesn't allow, doesn't shine quite as much as he could. He, he's an extraordinary man, um, and his his. I mean, I've I've done several things that he's designed and 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 made over the years, and he's so clever, um, and he's so incredibly easy to get on with as well. Everything, nothing is too much trouble. It's just lovely, very good. And one of the other famous kids shows that you worked on as well was Grot Bags. Oh. Was that good fun to work on? Oh, absolutely hysterical from start to finish. Oh yes, oh yes, 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 yes. I mean, you, you, um, once you once once you get used to, well, you have to get used to Carol um, Lee Scott, the way that she she was and the way she worked. Um, she was very much forced to be reckoned with. I think she she was incredibly nice. Um, very, uh, very, very, very professional. Um, came from a, a background of variety entertainment uh, and light entertainment television as well, and German children's television too. Um, surprisingly, she, I think, had very little self-confidence. She was immensely engaging as a performer to to look at and to work with, and she did, she had some some charm which came through used to come through very very clearly with her. But, but she was very 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 unconfident um, in what she did. I think you could you, you had to be a bit careful with her that something you might say might might just upset her. Um, and you know she didn't have tantrums or anything like that, but it just might dent her confidence so that it would spoil something. Uh, but terribly, uh, terribly good performer, and terribly nice person to work with, um, and that, those those series were great fun. They really were lovely because they, they had no money, There's, um, virtually no budget at all. So the whole thing is dependent on its very well written dialogue, and uh, the di the dialogue of those programmes is is classic stuff. Bob Hescott, who who wrote them? It's a bit like working. With, it was a bit like working with Noel Coward on occasion. He could write anything about anything, and it would be funny. Yeah, and it's a shame really because that kind of that kind of television is kind of lacking really in the world of children's TV now. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah certainly because you're not. You're not. You. The, the trouble is that that people don't credit the audience with a brain anymore. You, you don't. You. you, you Producers and, and anybody who put programs together like that, 
they, they seem to be so scared of, of actually slightly challenging the audience or, or perhaps... Perhaps they just don't get the humour themselves sometimes, and 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 it it leaves so much unexplored, so much so much fun that could be had just isn't, and it, that's it's terribly it, it's terribly it's actually rather, it's actually rather boring, you know what they think a lot of what they come up with now is boring. They think it isn't, they think it's brilliant, but but it does come across as oh, not the same old again. You know why do you want to make this year's version of that of a series that was twenty years old um, or ten years old or something? Actually, ten years old probably twenty years old. It probably would have been better, but there we are. <laughs> Never mind. As long as it keeps people employed, that's the main thing. Definitely. And uh, what characters did you play in Grot Bags? I played two characters in Grotbags, or three characters actually. I played um, um, one of Grotbags' uh, chums in her in her castle home, um, I, a, a, a bat called Colin. Um, he was called Colin after the director, who was a, a delightful man called Colin Clues, um, uh, and. Uh, Colin the Bat was, was he could talk like that, he had a slightly soppy voice like that, um, but he had an edge to him as well if he wanted to, so he could give as good as he got. Um, and uh, yes, Colin the Bat was a, a delightful, delightful thing to do. It was a completely lunatic script, always. I mean, they were just, it, it came up with really wonderfully silly dialogue all the time. It's very good. Um, and they were terrifically strong characters to play. They, they, they were great. Um, and the, the other one, oh, you see, the the the, the other character I've, I I played was um, down in the cellar of the castle, which was um, the, I played the uh, inside Grotbags' cauldron, which was again filled with wallpaper paste. Um, lived at leftover lump of old spells that, that that had somehow got congealed together into a into a very um silver tongued character with big front teeth and he was called lumpy and lumpy was based entirely on noel coward like that and spoke in a very clipped voice like this and was had had a certain intellectual humor and uh, and it was just he, he would refer to Grothbags as the Green Scream, and uh, it was um, quite amusing. And uh, the, the cauldron was was the cauldron was called Grumble. <laughs> the cauldron had a lugubri sort of Brummy accent like that. I think you all have heard that. And uh, so the two of them lived together and in in wonderful harmony, and uh, had a sort of bitchy on the screen relationship. They were they were very they. Were, very good characters. Bob's writing for those was just beautiful. It was very good for the whole thing. It's really nice. And I have to say, as someone who comes from the outskirts of Birmingham, your Brummy accent is very good. Thank you very much indeed. I, I, I pride myself <laughs> on being able to pick up accents. I like it. I enjoy it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just you, you can't work on spitting image, which was made entirely in Birmingham, and not pick up on something like that. <laughs> it is very good. It is yeah, very thank good. you. <laughs> and uh, you did mention it earlier, but there is one show that you had involvement with for many, many years, a, a show that I absolutely loved and still very popular to this day. You were the head on Art Attack. I was. How did that role come about? Um, the first two series of Art Attack, which, is, which had... Um, between the show's items, it had little reminders of what you could make and how you could make them. And those little reminders were set in an art gallery and were put across by um, a sculpted head, um, which was supposed, I think, to be Roman, in sort of stone Roman head on, on, a, on a pedestal. And they used... Uh, Human actors for these for the first two series, I think, uh, and it for some reason didn't quite work, didn't convince, or the actors in question didn't enjoy doing it, or something. But anyway, eventually they they hit on the idea of using a puppet for the head, and I was working on something in the same building at the time, and we started talking about it, and they said, "Would you be interested?" And it was a very, very, very good working relationship. It was quite lovely. They were delightful all the way through. 
I did it for 17 series, which is, which is a lot. So yes, I did it for nearly 17 years. Um, and it was tremendously good fun. It was always very, it was quite simple because my my bits were usually done done and dusted within two days. So that so that was uh, it meant that it was comparatively easy to do. But it was just fun. It was nice. It was, it was silly stuff. It was, very, very, very nice people in a very small environment um, in Kent. So that was it was lovely. It was good. I'm very grateful to them. They were very nice. Always. It was great. It and was very uh... loyal. They were always very loyal. They always came back, which was nice. Yes, it was a great show, a very, very much loved show, really, not just in this country, but yeah. all over the world. And and even now, I'm, I don't know if you've ever seen like the amount of stuff that's posted on social media about how the head um, was quite trippy and uh, yeah. always seemed like he was on something, but uh, it was funny. Ah, oh, yes, 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 yeah, I think I might have seen something. Yes, 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 he, 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 he wasn't. <laughs> um, his eyes, which were radio controlled, could sometimes take on a bit of a life of their own um, because I had to have the eye control on my knee and um, do that with my spare hand. And sometimes they were a little less responsive than they could have been, but um, so it might have accounted for the slightly trippy look. But uh, I always enjoyed doing his uh, hello, it's me, the head, that sort of thing, you know. And then when he'd have hysterics about ha, 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 nothing, nothing in particular. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to uh, hear you could still do the voice and prove that you are the head. Ah, well, yes, there we are. Yes, that's the, that's the um, that, that's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, when I told some of my friends uh, earlier on this week that I was interviewing you, I think the first thing that I got back in a text message was just, hello, it's me, the head. There you are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It was, um, I remember talking about grot bags just now. I remember um, being on a train quite late at night um, going going home from, from Waterloo uh, in London. Um, and... A couple of seats away, there was a group of four medical students from St. Thomas's Hospital, which is very near Waterloo Station, for those who know. Um, <coughs> and they were talking about television programmes. And one of them suddenly said, oh, well, um, have, we seen, uh, have, have, have we all seen the latest grot bags? And uh, they all started talking about it, and this young this young man suddenly started doing an impression of my character Colin the Bat, and he did a very good <laughs> impression of it as well. So I thought, well, I've got to join in. So <laughs> I joined in. Say, hello. I've never heard anybody try and do me before. It's very funny. And, it, and he looked, and he said, he just looked at me, and he said. God, he said, it really is you, isn't it? Is it you? <laughs> I said, yes, it is, actually. I said, you have to do, I have to say you do the voice very well. And he said, I've never met anyone famous before. <laughs> <laughs> it was very sweet. <laughs> and uh, nothing like that has happened before or since. <laughs> so, yeah. That's the one thing with working in puppetry, really. Like, you work on all these shows, mm. but you can still remain incognito. You can still walk down the street and not be pestered. You can go and buy baked beans in Tesco. Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. I mean, some, sometimes that's, sometimes that's, uh, of course, um, you wish people would recognise you for what you've just done, but most most of the time it's quite it's quite good that they don't. Um, but then you have to explain what you do, and uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, you 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 get the idea. Some people don't ever. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've always enjoyed watching programmes with puppets in, and yeah. I'm one of those. I'm one of those people, one of the few people who bothered to read the credits and uh, kind of picked up that some puppet characters on kids' TV had similar voices, and thought, well, it's got to be the same person. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. We'll, we'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, just one more thing with Art Attack. Actually, um, what's it like working with Neil Buchanan? Um, well, we, we, he, he was always. I mean, I knew I. Um, I knew him from a program called Ah. That's how we. That's how we met. I knew him from a program called Motormouth, uh, which I'd done some work on. Um, and he, he, it was around that time I think that he came up with the idea of Art Attack, and he was always 
just again like you know, like David Bowie, he's just a professional. He, you, he gets on with the job. He's very amusing, very nice, very ordinary. Just gets on with the job, and that's what you want, you know. It's um, it's such a relief when when somebody is when somebody knows what they're doing knows exactly what they're doing, they know exactly what they want and how to achieve it, and they get on with it and do it. But um, when the heads bits were done, uh, we, we, were not, uh, we were not in the studio at the same time because Neil had done his bits or was still in the middle of doing his bits, and they weren't done at the same time as the head. Um, so we, we tended not to meet very often. Uh, but but uh, there's nothing sinister about that. We, we always, always got on very well. Um, it was... He was all, he was always extremely well good good at his job I think is the best way of putting it um, and and nice as well you know they, they, it's mostly these people and most these people mostly these people are very nice especially in children's television because if they're not they tend not to last very long because people it's too much like hard work uh, having to cope with 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 tantrums and things and it's not you know you might you might as well be nice about it. And uh, Neil Buchanan, I mean, he's a legend, really, of children's television. Did so many shows for so long. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, really good. Really loved his stuff. Um, the other show as well, which I really enjoyed watching as a child myself, was uh, Wizardora. And oh, yes. you, uh, you played Hangle on that. I did in the first two series. I didn't go beyond the first two series because other things came up. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, Wizardora, yes, indeed. What can I tell you about that? Ask me questions. Well, I mean, what was it like to work on? Because it was quite a large puppet cast, a large ensemble of puppets, and then obviously there was Wizardora herself. It must have been quite good fun to uh, work with. It was great fun to do because the people who were doing it were very nice. I I have to confess I didn't like the programme. Again, I'm very glad to have done it because everybody's heard of it. it was nice to have created the character of Hangle, which, I, as I say, I only did for the first two series. It got taken over by somebody who w- was asked, can you do the voice? Um, and he managed, somebody I'd worked with many times before who was extremely good at what he does, and, and I think he quite enjoyed doing Hangle. And um, uh, uh, the Hangle was a sort of, you know, he says, oh, Wizardora, yes. <laughs> it was one of those, you know. Um, and uh, this sort of cynical character like that, this this old codger who lived in a, I think he lived in a wardrobe, didn't he? Because he was a coat hanger, basically, wasn't he? <laughs> was he? Answer yes, me. he was, he yes, was. Thank yes, you. thank you, thank <laughs> you. Caught you napping there, didn't I? Um, yeah, well, he was, uh, he was all right. The, the person who I think one has to admire in that programme was, um, was Adora herself, um, played by Wendy van der Plank, uh, for a, uh, the first, I don't know how many series she did it for, it was the first half dozen or something. Um, but she certainly, I mean, she created the character and she, she did it. And I have no idea how she learnt what she had to learn because she knew every word of it all the time. And the, and the speed at which it was shot was quite remarkable. It was a very fast turnaround. And she seldom dried up on her lines she always seemed to know exactly what she was doing and she had to learn what for the most part was drivel um (laughs) and it's very difficult to learn drivel you know i don't know whether you've ever tried to learn drivel but it's very very difficult to learn it um because there's because there's no logic to it there's nothing you can actually hang your brain on and and uh, work out what you're saying next I, i can't say i hated doing it i didn't at all um but there, but I, I have to say there are certain things I did not like about it, um, and I, I don't think I ever made any secret of how I felt. Uh, so there we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, play, I, play, I did play another character in that, was, which was the character that lived in the bottom of the chest of drawers. No, not the own. Uh, was he? Was he? Which one was he? It was. There was top, sticky, and bottom. Yes. Uh, did I end up by playing? I think I might have ended up by playing bottom. Um, yes, I ended, that's right. I ended up by playing bottom. I think um, 
who was sort of writ like Eccles in uh, the Goon Show, but he had been created. That character had been created by somebody else. So, so for the first couple of series, people chopped and changed a little bit. Um, but I, I can't remember whether it did Hangel and then another character from the word go, or or that I did Hangel and then got given Bottom as well. I, I did. I did. I did end up doing Bottom. I think. Um, it's a long time ago, you know. Yes, it was. I think it started in ninety three on the television. Was so, it? Was yeah. it? Yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Oh well. Good. And it did run for a long time. I mean, it's interesting to hear um, your thoughts on it, really. I mean, I mean, I was very young, so you know, I'll watch it and think it's brilliant. You know, everything's brilliant when you're that age. Um, it is a show that does come up a lot on social media. It is uh, a very fondly remembered series. When you see Wizardora came along at the time when there was actually a kind of reduction in programmes. There was a reduction in choice of programmes for children of a very young age. Things were being cut back and cut back and cut back mm-hmm. so much. And it was all Wizardora came up around the time that um, all the ITV franchises were sold off. I think, um, which is the early nineties, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so you suddenly had people simply not making programmes anymore, and 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 then doing. Oh, what have we got? What have we got in our franchise document that's cheap? Uh, oh, let's let's get this one out. That's right. That's right. Yes, that's ready to go. And so they do that. And suddenly, if you know, if, if to be blunt about it, if you put a farting donkey in a pink tutu on television every day, <laughs> it'll be popular. Yes. <laughs> well, it will, because <laughs> people haven't got any other choice. No, no that's and, and, true. Uh, and, 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 and it's, it, 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 well, I think what children's television lacked at that particular period was diversity. It actually was very careful to avoid any kind of diversity or anything that might possibly rock the boat in any way. They were all too keen to keep everybody happy. So you, you, you lost out to things that were perhaps mediocre rather than superb. I'm, I, if I sound bitchy, I apologise. I don't mean to. No, I get what you're on about. It, it does happen. And there are some shows out there that I remember watching, and there's some now, and I think... Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the thing with nostalgia is, is sometimes you know, you, nostalgia. It's it's almost a rose tinted spectacle oh, thing. Oh, the sun always shines. And um, sometimes you look, you watch stuff again as an adult, and you think, why did I enjoy watching that? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yes, 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 yes absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, it's all. It always starts with the script. Um, if it's not, if it hasn't got a good script, it doesn't really stand a chance. And um, because. A good script gives its audience the credit. What I said before is gives the audience the credit of having a brain. Um, and and you, know, you, you, don't, you don't have to write nuclear physics at all, but you do have to treat the audience as though it has a brain. And if you don't do that, it shows. And you can have as much colour and movement as you like, but ultimately it falls apart because something is wrong. Yeah, I get what you mean. But uh, one children's programme that uh, was about in the 90s, which had some fantastic writing, mm-hmm. and I did enjoy, uh, was a show that you co-created, and that was Bug Alert. Oh, did you? You saw that? You saw it? Oh, yes. I remember I was chatting to my mum about it last night, and yeah. I remember watching it, because it was always on very early in the morning. Right. I always yes, used to yes, watch yes, it before school. I remember right. it. Yep. Yeah, and you and you enjoyed you enjoyed it. Absolutely, I you, think I've still. I know this might sound a bit sad. I think somewhere I've got a DVD of it somewhere in a cupboard that's been sat there for years that needs digging out. I think excellent because one of the sad things about it was that it only ever um, produced two commercial DVDs with very few programs on them, and um, uh, those are from the first series, which was nothing like as. Um, let's say, adventurous as the later ones. Um, <clears throat> Peter Eyre, who directed it, and I co-wrote it um, because we asked if we could, basically. We got on terribly well doing something else. And um, we, we, we asked if we could co-write it together. And eventually, the producer, who, who, also, who also invented the show, um, rather grudgingly agreed, that, oh, well, all right then, because they... <laughs> think she thought it would be safer to try and keep us under control and um as soon as we were given the go-ahead to try and to to, to co-write it we we had the most astonishing fun it really was side-splittingly funny to work on it was a wonderful show that that will remain always 
one of the one of the real highlights even even if people haven't seen it, I actually don't care. It was tremendously good fun to work on because I think we did some wonderful material. I think we just created such such fabulous situations and such lunatic dialogue in the bits that are allowed to have their own free reign. Um, that you see that that has an educational element to it as well, although you may not ever think so. But I think that for me is how educational television works well in an in an entertainment format. Um, oh yeah, it was it was it was glorious to do. It's just such lunatic stuff, and largely largely due to Peter. I mean, the the the, the way that we wrote it was that um, Peter, who who lives out of London. Uh, would pick me up from the railway station uh, in the morning. We'd drive back to his home, and we'd start writing. And uh, we'd write until lunchtime when we'd go out and buy a sandwich, and we'd come back and finish the episode we were working on, and then he would drive me back to the station, and I'd go home. And um, we used to spend most of our writing period in hysterics over how clever we were <laughs> and um, it, that means over how clever peter was generally because he was absolutely superb he once he got once he got going he was so much in his element um doing a sort of <sighs> are you acquainted with the jennings books at all jennings goes to school and things like that sadly not no. lunatic sort of 1950s boy's own humour. Um, very, very, very innocent, but very funny. Um, but that people... Uh, sort of com- com- comic comic humour, com- comic strip humour, comic comic book humour, like, like the Beano and, and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, fabulously bright, very, very, very off the wall, but, but, but fabulously... Um, I, the, the word intellectual is wrong, but again, it treats the audience as though it's got a brain. And not to do so is, is, is slightly to insult your very young audience. There's always a danger where you can go over your audience's heads, but they can always ask what, what they've just seen. They can always, always ask about it, can't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, did you? Did you ever? Um, I can't remember. I just, I just remember enjoying it, um, watching it every morning. Why did you enjoy it? Um, I always liked, I mean, I was always a fan of shows with puppets in. Mm. Um, like, I was always watching that and shows like Sooty. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you recall Bodger and Badger on yeah, the BBC. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. another one that I liked. Yeah. But uh, it was just the, the silly humour of it. I think anything that was really ridiculously off the wall mm. <laughs> was just mm. appealed to me. And even to this day, off the wall humour, obscure humour, just always, always works with me. Yes, but, but, but you got it. You got the fact that it yeah, was funny. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Which is, which is what it was intended to be. We wrote it to amuse ourselves. I mean, if, if Peter didn't find it funny, we didn't put it. It didn't end up in the script because he made sure of that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, he, he and the producer would have some spectacular fights over over certain jokes that he, that he was absolutely determined were going to go in, and we would suddenly be told no. And uh, there was an, there was very little argument, but somehow or other, most of them ended up back in there. <laughs> and we were, I have to say, blessed with the most wonderful cast. Um, Rebecca Negan and Joe Greco, who, who were my co-performers in it, were such a dream to work with. They understood it. They got it completely. Um, it, it, was, it was a classic example of... Um, people, kept, people kept saying to us while we were doing it, oh, you know, this should be on, this should be on um, primetime television, Channel 4, blah, 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 blah. It's perfect alternative humour, which is exactly what it was intended to be for kids. And it, it worked, I think, largely because the performances are so good, with good writing. Um, it, it actually... <sighs> It, it's a it's a little gem. It really is. And the, the the third series that we did has some wonderful programs in it. They're very very good. They're extremely funny even now. Um, and it's just it's just tragic that they didn't appear on DVD properly. It was never properly marketed. Uh, and that's budgetary reasons, I think. Yeah, definitely. It's one of those shows which um, was great. But like, and I was saying to you when I spoke to you earlier in the week, like. 
there aren't many people I know who remember it. I mean, it is mm. quite popular. If you go online, there are plenty mm. of people online who talk about it. But in oh, terms yeah. of like mm. people I know, mm. it just feels like it's one of those shows that was kind of overlooked. Maybe because of the time slot it was on, I don't know, because it was on very early in the morning. And it's a great shame. But you said about the DVD, uh, the, you know, the DVDs, there weren't many of them. The one good thing is, is that there are quite a number of them on YouTube for people to watch. There as are, well. aren't there? Yes, I've, I've, I've found them occasionally. And, and, and there are some good ones on YouTube as well. Which is nice, which is lovely. Um, yes, so anybody who wants to go and watch it on YouTube, feel free, um, because <laughs> they're well worth it, <laughs> especially the later ones. <laughs> yeah, they're brilliant. Um, I, I, the, um, I think the songs are wonderful in it as well. They're tremendous. Um, we we performed all the songs as well. Uh, well, Joe Greco and I performed all the songs. <laughs> we, we we would. Um, go down to the composer. Uh, he, he lives in uh, the wilds of the Welsh-English borders. And um, to to record the songs, we, we would go down there during the day, um, spend most of the night recording all the songs for the series, and, and then come back up to Inaka the following day. It was a lovely way to work. It was great. Um, yeah, it's very good. It did have a great theme tune as well, um, with the kazoo and everyone going with the ugly, cuddly bugs. Yes, 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 with the bugs inside your kitchen that you never knew were there. Um, it, it's interesting that the, the way the characters are introduced in that song, because they were the way they were originally conceived, and the way they are in the series bears very little relation to what they were in that song. Um, they're, they're, you just have to take it for what it is. Um, it's a good song. It's lovely. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, there were quite a lot of uh, characters in it. So I'm trying to remember. There was Plugbug, uh, Grubbug. Uh, there was it's Mystic Mug. Mystic Mug. Doodlebug as well. Doodlebug, who lives inside the dustbin. Yeah. Yes. Um, Supposedly. Grubbug wasn't there as well. Grubbug, who was the, who was the cook? Yes, and and the general sort of who's a sort of Basil Fawlty character. I thought that. I I was going to ask you. Was it based on John Cleese? Because no, I thought not that. at all. No, he he was he was based on um, me in my most impossible moment, uh, and uh, he's just basically being a pompous fart, and uh, <laughs> it's it's. I, it was well, it's a wonderful character to play. It really was. It's quite delightful. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> such a simple. They're such simple puppets. They didn't have blinking eyes or anything that moved apart from their arms and and and, and the mouths. And it just their puppetry. It is simplest and most effective. Um, it's just you can do so much with them. And they were really um, they they were terribly well made by. Uh, Andy Fraser and Tracy Lilly, who also worked on, uh, they also worked on the Samiad on Five Children and It. So it's all a, a, a very small world, <laughs> um, and um, they they just did such a lovely, simple, effective job for for the money available. You know, they 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 you have to remember about Bug Alert was done extremely cheaply, and um, as it, because it had to be. Uh, and and as a result, I think you think what you've got is is very 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 good television. It's very good fun. It is. It is fantastic. Mm. And uh, so, apart from Grubbug, did you do any of the other characters in it? I did. I did. There's a, a sort of green hairy character. There are two characters that live under the stairs in a cupboard. Yeah. Are called Grunge and Slop. And, and they, they talk a bit like this, you know. And my character was called Grunge. And he's the one with the, he's the one with the the he, well he's the more snide one of the two, and he's I used to like playing him because they they was there was nothing nice about those two characters you know <laughs> it was, they laughed at other people's misfortune. And uh, can you still do a Grubbuck's voice? Well, yes, I can. This is just the way. It's really rather... <laughs> you know, I always say that when somebody wants to try and do something, all they have to do is do it. You? Yes? <laughs> That's fantastic. You? Yes? Thank you. And he was so full of himself, always. And what I liked about him was he always had a kind of pratfall at the end of it. 
Yes. Um, you know, he was never allowed to get away with anything. <laughs> Poor thing. He, uh, he, he was, he, they, they were such lovely characters. I liked playing Mystic, and played Mystic Mug as well. I used to like doing it. He, hello, boy. She would come and she was always, so we, we agreed that she was absolutely mad. And that was the way to approach it was that she was mad. <laughs> and, uh, and, and she was, she was completely bonkers. <laughs> I always remember that Grubbug used to do a lot of these cookery demonstrations. Yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, some of them were, just didn't sound that particularly nice. So I'm, sure they I I'm sure they weren't. <laughs> but ev- everything that he demonstrated was actually eatable. You could do it without poisoning anyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lashing fromage frais. Um, it was always fromage frais or something involved. It was a wonderfully middle class element to add to it, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> very, very. No, I did genuinely think it was based on John Cleese and Basil Thalty. So thanks for clearing that up. No, it really, it honestly wasn't. Um, it, it, it it just happened to work like that. It was uh, the the, ca- the character was was so full of bullshit and hot air that that that, that he he just happened to work to work like that. Um, and the relationship in in the the um, in the the home, and then later when they acquired the cafe as well, just it, it, it he he did become very Basil Fawlty-ish, but not deliberately. It just happened to work out like that. Um, and and we did seventy two of those, and there weren't many Fawlty Towers. No, there weren't. <laughs> uh, but thank you for uh, being responsible for a show that I absolutely adored watching as a child. Good, 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 good. good. Excellent. It wasn't 72, it was 78, I beg your pardon. 78 <laughs> half hours, which is a lot of telly. It is, it is, it is a lot. <laughs> I'm glad you, really glad you liked it, because one so seldom sees people who've ever seen it or heard of it. No, I do remember watching it Good. quite regularly Good. when it was when it was on. Oh, yeah, God. definitely. Good. And uh, you mentioned it earlier as well. Um, you worked on Sutty for a while. I mean, what was it like? I mean, it must have been such an honour to work on one of the most famous and longest-running puppet TV shows of all time. Yes, um, yes, it, it, it had a slightly... It, it, I worked on series 50 and 51. I don't know how many they've done since. They've done quite a lot since. Um, when I worked on it, 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 had, it was going through one of those strange things. It had been sold to somebody who'd bought it and sold it again and, 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 and that kind of thing. So it was, changing, <clears throat> it was changing identity and changing the people who were behind it. Um, it was it was great fun to do um i mean it was well it was tremendous fun to do because it, it, again it had it had a very good cast um richard coombs who played sooty uh was <laughs> is is a very 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 gifted puppeteer he's absolutely wonderful um I I was given the choice, did I want to do Sooty or Sweep? And I chose Sweep because Sweep has the dialogue and doesn't have to mime. <laughs> and I mean, it's actually easier. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I might still have, I don't know if, it, if I can get my hands on it. Oh, it's a squeaker. Um, I've got one of Sweep's squeakers here. Should I give you a blast? Yes, please. If I can get it to work, hang on. not being very subtle and so it's not wet enough which sounds awful <laughs> that's how it works um, no, it's, these, 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 the squeakers are made of um, they, they were, they were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in a big box and they were, they were made in bulk by a, a, a gentleman who I think had been in the toy making business at some stage and made sort of squeakers for soft toys um, and they're made on a, an oval of cardboard with a wire strip and a plastic strip through which you control the sound by blowing through it and controlling it with your teeth. And the, the one that I just picked up, I've forgotten, was on a shelf here, and it is. Um, and so it hasn't been used for, well, I don't know if it's ever been used, but it's there as an example for those who wish to know. And um, it, 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 you can be incredibly... Uh, expressive with that, uh, it can be. It can, well, it can probably do Shakespeare if you want, and I don't want to try and do to be or not to be or something. But you can do it. Um, you can also be very rude. Um, so yeah, it was. It was. It was good. Sooty was good fun. It was good fun to do it. It, it, was, it was good fun to do it. Um, Peter Eyre, who 
produced, uh, who uh, directed and co-wrote Bug Alert with me was the one who asked me whether I wanted to be Sooty or Sweep because he, he produced Sooty, the, the series that I worked on. And um, so, it's a, again, it's a very small world. Um, and uh, it, it was, it, it, there, there was some, again, some very good television in that, some very nice moments, I think. Um, the, the puppets were completely... Uh, we were completely redesigned and remade for that for those two series. I don't know whether they're still using the ones we had or whether they've gone back to the old ones, which are slightly smaller, and work on three fingers rather than a whole hand. Um, it's much more expressive to be able to put the puppet on a whole hand um, because you can you can be far more flexible. You can you can you, it can nod where it can nod. It can do things. It it it, it can pick things up easily. Um, Whereas the the original ones, which were just uh, index finger, middle finger, and thumb, are, are much more difficult to control. Anything you you can't look from left to right easily without turning the whole whole puppet. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, so so we had them we had them remade, re redesigned, and remade. Uh, and uh, I I think that I think the new ones were were a very good thing to have done. I think I think they certainly were much more expressive i think anyway that's just but that's just me um i, I don't know what i don't know what other people thought um we, um we were quite happy working with them they were they were they were good um and the uh, supporting actors that came in to the series to do other characters were were also very good they were excellent um, maybe there was one girl who played a burglar in it. She was absolutely tremendous. I can't remember her name, but it was. Oh, she was. She was very, very good. Very funny. Very I good. remember that episode. Yeah, she was. She was. She, she was. Eva. Eva. Something. Her name was. She was. She was very. She was very clever. I think she had a ball doing it. I think she really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, because it was the series where they all ran a hotel, that's wasn't right. it? That's yeah. It, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember it. I do remember it. They have gone back to the old design puppets since. I say, that's interesting. I think because uh, Richard Cadell ended up buying it off whoever owned it, he did, and yeah, he's he uh, kind of took it back to its roots and uh, made the show successful again. Good, so. good. Were you trying to say that it wasn't successful? When we it did? was. It was. It's <laughs> just <laughs> well, there was a long, there was a oh, long, there was a long out. gap. <laughs> well, there was, there was a long gap where it wasn't on the telly. So you know, yeah. he bought it and said, yeah. you know, can I bring it back? And they yeah. said, yeah. yeah. So you know, um, you know. Uh, Third time lucky, I suppose. Well, it was Harry Corbett. Oh yes, Matthew's yes. Dad, then Matthew. Then Matthew. Then, yeah. uh, then the various reincarnations before Richard bought it. Yeah, well, Richard was involved in the the hotel one, but he well, didn't he actually operate was. the puppets. He, he was the he was the human presenter, and he he I think is is exactly what makes that show what it is because he has he has the sort of. Um, he has the sort of mixture of music hall good humour and sentiment that Harry Corbett had at the in the original version. Um, he, he's exactly right for it. He's, there's a warmth to Richard Cadell's work, which is absolutely wonderful. It's really lovely, and he was so good to work with because he was such a spot-on performer. Um, it's always nice when that happens because you, you, you know he's got the timing. You know you, whatever you do with him, you know it's going to work. And um, one other thing, actually, because you said you did sweep, didn't you do butch as well? Because I'm sure that sounds I like did, your yes. other characters. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, 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 I did do butch as well. It's your right one, not that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, uh, I, I, yes, it was lovely to have done to have done butch. I, I'm not sure that I ever quite got him really. It was. Uh, I think. I think I did. I think it was all right. Um, it was. I found sweep much more interesting. Um, I don't don't think Butch ever quite had the right involvement in the storylines um, where where I was concerned. I don't think I quite knew what my part of it was. Um, but that's again that's that's neither here nor there. It doesn't really matter. I mean, we just did it and hope it's going to work. It, it did. Um, but Sweep was the one I enjoyed. Um, yeah, I think everyone enjoyed Sweep. He was just so funny. Good, excellent. Excellent. You are good. You're kind, aren't you? <laughs> I, I'm. A, I, I've always been a big fan of Sutty, even now. You know, I'm far too old for it, but still love it. Still great. No, I think no. I think people. I think people. Think you know, humor is humor, and and um, I think puppets work 
um, and always do work for adults as well, because I think if you're looking at them as an adult, I think you tend to, to fill in the blanks. You've, I think mentally you fill in the bits that aren't there, and you, you create your own scenarios with puppets, so you make them into something that perhaps isn't there in the original, but you, that you've added psychologically or mentally. I think that is why puppets work, generally, yeah. because people fill in the blanks. So when you start seeing an all-singing, all-dancing, all-everything in CGI, I think that's why it doesn't necessarily work. No. There's too much. Yeah. There is too much of it in, te- in kids' TV and television, full stop, I think. But, yeah, but also you don't leave enough to the viewer's imagination. No. And because no, no. it's essentially an inanimate object, uh, you have to leave something to the viewer's imagination. Um, because it's not living, breathing tissue. It's not. It's not. There isn't a brain there. There isn't. You know. There isn't a soul there. So you have to leave it for the audience to put it in. Yeah, I think it's really good when you know you're watching the program. You know it's a puppet, but you're thinking, how, how do they do that? How do they make mm. it look that lifelike? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. 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 Um, and it go, it goes beyond you know perfect lip sync or something like that. It's nothing. Not necessarily anything to do with that. It's 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 just the way that it plays with other characters, the way that it does, it can be one little look, which you know a live actor could never do. It's interesting. It's a very interesting business altogether, very interesting craft altogether. Yeah, I mean, aside from the stuff you've been involved with, the other the other, the other puppet uh, shows of the era, which I thought were just so well done, and you're thinking, where's the puppeteer hiding, was um, stuff that the Ragdoll did, like Tots TV and Rosie and Jim, oh, those yeah, kind absolutely, of shows. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Rebecca Nagan, who played Rosie, um, we, we commandeered her for um, Bug Alert. Um, she was, she was um, Doodlebug. And uh, she was absolutely fantastic. Oh, God, she was good. <laughs> Hysterically funny. Um, uh, we originally found her for a series called Mortimer and Arabelle, which was a lovely, lovely, lovely collection of 15-minute children's dramas using puppets only, based on drawings by Quentin Blake. And the, the whole the whole world was created out of, of to look like Quentin Blake drawings, and it's a lovely story about a small girl and her pet raven, and all the characters in it are puppets. And I think it's the first time that there has ever been an all puppet drama on the screen, um, and we did uh, two years worth of that. And Rebecca Nagan came in to the second series, and she she was she was excellent. And then we 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 just sort of kept working with her she, because she was just good at what she did she's a very good performer and uh, very good voices too voices are important it, it is true actually because the the one thing is i mean you've you, the voices that you've done with your characters are so versatile and it's like your natural speaking voice sounds nothing like the ones that you've portrayed and it is quite it is quite magical when you switch into one of them and there's so oh, many lovely. that you've done lovely how oh, nice if I, I i i would hope so uh, that's that's um that, that's part of it. Is, um, I mean, giving giving something its own voice is very much part of puppeteering. I think it's it's um, it's a very important part of the character. You can't you know, if the thing has dialogue, you've got to give it the voice that people will believe. Absolutely, and you did some very good voices down the years. Like I said, you know, there is a, a very long list of credits to name. I mean, apart from the shows that we have spoken about today, are there any others that are really good that are really fond memories of? Um, I have actually fond, I have fond memories of most things, really. I've just switched me a bit of paper gone. Um, I have fond memories of most things that that I've worked on. I, I, I am quite, uh, I am quite, I'm quite sentimental about things. I do, I do enjoy doing it. Um, it's. Oh, I, I, I worked on a, I worked on a lovely one called Beachcomber Bay, which I, I, I can't even remember who it was made yes, for. Yes, I remember that. It was on Channel Five. Milkshake. That's right. That's yeah. it. That's it. That's it. Yes. Um, Beachcomber Bay was 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 another one. It's very good fun, um, and. Uh, just very well done for what it is. It's you know it doesn't pretend to be anything it isn't. Uh, it looks very good. The characters are very good. The scripts are sweet, um, and and you can be very creative with them. And it's very simple. That's the other thing is it's very simple. It looks fantastic and it's very simple. And um, it, it 
you know, that that's, some, often works best, doesn't it? Yes, simplicity always works mm. best. You don't want to overcomplicate things no, sometimes. No, 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 no. So, so, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, I can't say I haven't had fun. You know, I, I really have. Um, a tremendous, I, yeah, I think, yes, over, over the year, over the years that I've done it. And I, I left drama school in 1976, which is quite a long time ago. Um, I, I think for most of the time since, I've actually enjoyed myself enormously. Um, and been, I've, most of all, I've been very, very lucky. I've, I've met people that I've got on very well with um, on both sides of the camera or in the theatre or whatever, if, I, if I've done theatre work, um, and I've been very, very lucky. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's, it's worked out well. So, but, but yes, I'm, I have been, I've been very lucky. Um, good, good, good. Mm. Fantastic. Mm. And, um, you know, if, if, if someone come up to you today and said, you know, I want to be a puppeteer, mm. what words of advice or encouragement would you give them? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what people say when people say, oh, I really want to be an actor. What should I do? Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, words of encouragement. Um, learn your craft. Um, act. Be an actor. Learn how to act. I mean, you, 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 it, it, people who people who are, you, you you can't you know acting is something that people have naturally or not, and you can develop it and you can develop your techniques. Um, people who are naturally good performers um, don't necessarily make good puppeteers, but on the other hand, they can learn it if they try, and they can learn the techniques of it. Um, I'm not one of those people who thinks that. Um, in order to be a good puppeteer, you've got to be able to make puppets as well. I, I'm totally incapable of doing that. I've, I have absolutely no idea how to make a puppet at all, and I've never been able to because I'm not. I'm not good. With, I'm not good with my hands. I don't. I, I really don't know how to stick bits of stuff together and make a puppet out of it. I've absolutely no idea. Um, I really. Um, to be to be a puppeteer, I think I, th I think you've got to be an actor. You've got to be an actor first of all, and and learn the, about the craft of acting. <clears throat> work on your voice. Work on things like that. Work on your voice. You don't need to be a mime artist. You don't need to be a ballet dancer. You don't need to you know go off and study French mime for thirty five years. You really don't need to. What you need to be able to do is realise that if you're going to do puppeteering, most puppeteering is quite hard work physically. Um, for goodness sake, have some energy in performance. Have some energy. Be prepared to have a laugh. Be prepared to be prepared to act properly. When you see something that really fires you as a dramatic performance, either on stage or screen, that is good acting. All right? You can apply the same rules puppeteering oh well thanks for that advice <laughs> so any budding uh, puppeteers then that there's there's the the, uh, the words of advice that you need to adhere to for that i one. mean you know perform get used to performing mm -hmm. and you've got to enjoy it you know you've got to be a fan of what you're doing yes you've got to enjoy it and largely you'll enjoy it if it's well written i mean again we come back down to the script is it well written is it well put together is it a good show if, if it's a good show then you'll enjoy it and you really will well, um, following on from the, the days in children's television, I mean, what what have you been up to more recently? Um, what am I working on? Oh, I've been working. I've been doing. I've been working something quite different. I've been doing something totally different. I've been working as a voice coach on um, Call the Midwife, uh, which, which is lovely. Which is again, it's lovely to do it, um, and they're fantastically loyal. They keep coming back, which is good. Um, I started out by. Uh, tutoring one of the cast in how to do a Cockney accent of the 1960s, and I've been brought back to do a couple of other similar things since. And so that's what I've been doing recently. I've also been in a few reality shows um, as as myself, as a, as, a, as an elocution and voice teacher. <laughs> and and um, so I've, I've been doing things like that. Um, and puppeteering, there is not a lot of at the moment for me. Uh, I don't know why not. Um, I don't think there's anything around, is there? Is there anybody working I, on anything? I don't know, because I don't really watch any kids' TV anymore. I don't. I really don't know. No, I don't either. Um, there probably is, but it, it, I, I, I really... Um, I suppose I should turn it on and look, really, shouldn't I? 
Yeah, you, you could have a, you know, a flip through and think, I can do that. Yeah, but somebody else is doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why haven't I got that job? Why yeah, not well, exactly. Me? Yes, quite. Yes, yes. Why did, you go to, why did you go to them? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yes, well, there we are. Um, that's also part of getting older. That's something you discover as you get older. It's, um, uh, you know, pe- people move on and people do uh, want their own contacts around them and people that they've discovered and people that they've got to know and people that are roughly contemporary with them and that's just that's just a fact of life you just have to accept that and uh, also as you get older puppeteering hurts more it really does because you realize sometimes sometimes things are very heavy and uh, yes it's it's um but if somebody somebody says come and do xyz i would be very happy to give it a thought well, there we go. If anyone, anyone's uh, a TV producer listening to this, then give this man a call. <laughs> you, could, you, you could do worse, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great that, uh, you know, even though the, the puppetry work is, is a bit quiet, that you've still uh, you've got a fallback plan and you're still, uh, you know, enjoying oh, your right. work. Yes, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. Certainly there's very little else I can do. <laughs> um, it's uh, so one has to. It's, um, I've always I've been lucky enough to be able to stick with it. In one form or another, uh, yeah, we shall we shall see what the future holds. We shall, and it's uh, so. One final thing: um, you have got a, an excellent blog with stuff relating to your past TV work online. Mm, I mean, tell everyone about it. It's a it's WordPress, and it's Francis Wright, all one word. dot WordPress. dot com, and it, you it, it just uh, you will just find it, and I and I come up, and there's all sorts of different things on there. There's um, uh, the most most of the website is is to do with family history, which is something I find fascinating. I love doing that. Um, and uh, then there are there are other bits there down the right hand side of it. I think there, there's stuff about me, what I've done, lots of photographs, lots of production photographs, and things. Um, and and so it's 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 a, it's a good it's a tour around me. Basically, basically, it's a bit of ego online. Um, and because it's WordPress, it doesn't actually cost anything, so I stick with that. Um, and it's quite easy to do. I can do it myself in, in a couple of minutes, which is good. Um, but I do try and update it occasionally. I think I did something to it a couple of days ago. Uh, so, so, yes, I enjoy doing that. It's very good. And I like, I like loading the photographs onto the, the puppeteering stuff as well when it's there. Can't really go wrong with that. Can it's very simple, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I have had a look through the uh, production photos that you've uploaded, and they are fantastic. Yeah, yeah well, I think they te- I think they tell it how it is, don't they? <clears throat> Pretty much. Yeah, and you're always happy to, uh, uh, you know, if people leave a comment or a message, you're always happy to answer and answer people's questions, which is fantastic. Always reply. It's very rude not to. I always reply. Um, and people have been incredibly nice. I've had some very, 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 very pleasant people write in. Um, and with, with really, really decent, really decent um, comments and, and things. It's nice. It's lovely. It's good. Um, and they get published on there as well, so that's, that's nice. That's good. You got published on there, didn't you? I, you? You wrote to me on there, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes, that's how we got in contact. Well, exactly, they were. That shows that it works. Yes. <laughs> Um, it, was a, it was a nice surprise because I got the email. I think I left the message quite late at night and mm. by the next morning I got an email off you, yeah, which is fantastic. It's good. It's very nice. No, I'm very glad you got in touch. It's lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been great hearing your memories and your stories, ah, Francis. It's been great, great chatting to you today. Lovely. All right. All the right. very best. All the very best to you as well. Take care then. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that, why not check out the other podcast interviews available? And don't forget to check out my blog page as well. Link is in the description. Until next time, see you soon.